Thank you for coming here. It will be cozy regarding the amount of people and how we start. Yes, yeah, so um, I am Bohdan Serida. I work at CM Games and my partner is... Yeah, I'm Alexei Shulga. I'm the producer of Into the Radius VR, the game that we'll be mostly sharing info about. Yeah, so um, I think you might benefit from this talk if you're interested in VR, if you maybe done something and got some insight and would like to reflect on other people's experience in a way. So yeah, we both come from CM Games, X Creative Mobile, and we are part of the reason why the company changed its name in a way. So yeah, it was a bit funny. And we're gonna present everything in this talk from two perspectives. So Alexei is a producer, will share some product details, and me as a business person, I will look at the business side of the things in a way, and let's see how it goes. So yeah, and we'd love to know a little bit more about you. Like, uh, please raise your hands if uh, you made a VR game. Hey, <laughs> nice colleagues. And please raise your hand if you actually earn some money on VR games. <laughs> wow. Congratulations. <laughs> That's hard. Yeah. So, um, a bit about Into the Radius VR. I think that's your slide, Alex. Yeah, go on. Yeah, of course. Uh, so, what is Into the Radius? It's a single player VR shooter, and people sometimes describe it as Stalker VR, but no, we don't describe it like that. And uh, you are tasked with exploring this supernatural zone filled with dangerous landscapes, anomalies, and this kind of thing with realistic weapons. Yeah, so basically it's kind of hardcore-ish, unique game. Mm -hmm. And uh, a bit about numbers on Steam currently. So the game is launched on Steam, Oculus Rift, Viveport, and we launched uh, exactly or something around like two years ago we left early access uh, right now we have like 4,000 positive reviews and we sold around like uh, 150k copies and the total net revenue the juiciest number you could like have at this talk is 2.7 millions for two years so yeah you can compare to your appetites and stuff like that. And also the playtime for a VR game is a bit unusual when we look at the market. It's 25 hours for the main campaign. And of course, since it's a community-driven game, we'll be talking more about that later. We have like around 5,000 Discord members and I think this is our main treasure. Yes, come in, come in, come in, come in, yes. More people, okay. Yes, still cozy. So, um, yeah, I think, Alexei, you can shed some light on how it was before those big numbers, in a way. Yeah, so the project started uh, in spring 2017, like five years ago. I started it single-handedly as a prototype, and I was learning Unreal Engine for uh, myself, and I just like, oh, I need some project to learn it, and I st st started... It's so, and I was uh, working on it for some time, and then I was pitching it to the company, did it multiple times, failed. And so basically on, in May 2018, I got my first full-time employee, and I was working part-time, so we were like one and a half people working on the game for almost like two years or something. And we dragged it into the February 2019 uh, release on Steam, uh, but we did it uh, kind of in an interesting way. So uh, it's an early access game, uh, but we didn't uh, allow uh, the selling of the game. We just uh, printed a lot of keys and made a Discord bot that you had to like uh, type, and it would give you a key. So it allowed us to save up. Uh, on the burning through the audience, so like, and in simultaneously allowed to lots of users to experience the game and give, give us like huge amount of feedback. It was a 
like huge success for us because we gave around like 3,000 keys and uh, I don't know in a month. Uh, so yeah, it proved to the company and to everybody that there is interest for the game. So basically, it allowed us to greenlit the project, get a team of four on it, and start working. And we went into the early access and then left early access because nobody buys VR games in early access. Like in early access, we had like 20 reviews or something and the mixed rating. When we left early access, we were around 100 reviews and mixed rating. So it was a tough time for us because, yeah, like when you have these results, uh, people think that you should close the project. But we didn't. And luckily for us, we went with uh, working on our mistakes and we had a best earnings month in February 22 and we, uh, yeah, uh, announced the MetaQuest 2 port in April, and the port is coming in September. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, this is the slide which should be in every presentation. This is the team. Unfortunately for HR people here, we don't put names, so you cannot like contact them directly. But uh, just so you don't think it's only two guys who made the project, yeah, this is like the team we might forgot someone but these guys are actually the ones who like pulled it off and continue pulling it off because it's a live game but we will talk a bit more about that later so uh, yeah a bit of context on why we got into vr in the first place i think yeah alexi you again how was it for you yeah, thank you. So, as I was talking about, I were, I'm basically a 3D artist uh, background. I've been working in the industry for 15 years. At, at the time, I was like a 3D artist on a free-to-play game. And I was a bit uh, frustrated with the free-to-play model of game design because it's kind of of its restrictions. And I want to do something myself. Uh, and uh, VR came around like the Vive was at the at the time, and the controllers, and everybody understood that it's actually the future because, like, if you remember the Oculus Dev Kits, they were shipping with the, this Xbox controller because nobody sure like uh, how you play VR or like whatever. Uh, and most of the experience, like most of the content that was out there, were like sh very short experiences. Uh, so I thought that that's not actually why people buy VR. When you like buy this immersive fantasy, you're not like thinking about, oh, I'm going to just experience an experience for five minutes and put it somewhere uh, to gather dust. People were thinking like, I buy it and like I'll go and play Skyrim, Fallout, and all those like huge immersive games. But there were none. So. The other thing is actually Pioneer's interest because it's a new platform, new medium, new everything, and there's no like clear path to take. It, for me, it was like, I was thinking like, it can be actually a once in a lifetime opportunity to do something actually new. Uh, yeah, and Bogdan came a, a little bit later in the process, but here's his reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as a business person, I got later I got to everything of that later. I thought that Quest 1, the first autonomous headset, was close enough to the audience to start thinking about virtual reality because you can just take it, put it on your head, play, and this is something which it could work. At, at least that was my subjective perception. Also, uh, again, talking about subjective perception, VR market was surviving a metaphorical autumn. It wasn't that attractive. The first wave of investments and hype in this decade went through. So, like, again, in my perception, kind of nobody knew what to do with that. And it's counterintuitively actually the best time to get into the market because not many people go to search for gold in there. Uh, also, I was interested in testing a premium live game model, and I will talk about that a bit later. And I had personal ambitions about the quality of products which could be done inside our company. And as I was running research and development unit, I had an advantage to distribute resources according to my own reasoning. So at the time, I thought uh, VR could be a nice bet. And when I'm talking about when I say at the time, 
I mean 2019. Yeah, and this is basically the classic situation which happens if you're very passionate and start playing VR, then you're hitting everything in your room and you bash in TV. We were even compensating for these kinds of events to our employees. It was really happening. It's like meme based in reality. Yeah, um, and uh, I think it also important to talk why this project, like why can, like specifically into the radius, I guess. Yeah, Alexei, this is your turn. So yeah, from the start, I was think I was uh, having multiple concepts that I wanted to develop, and I had uh, some pillars that I uh, tested those concepts again to against to test if uh, I would want to do uh, to actually do those concepts. So uh, those pillars were if it should be actually a game like it should be long it should be meaningful it should be immersive it shouldn't be an experience and the other it should be different like it should be bold in i should question like every like uh, flat con like flat games conceptions and test if they actually fit the medium uh, so with with that, uh, I looked at the setting. What like setting to take? Uh, the fantasy market was a bit oversaturated. Like most games were like in some generic fantasy with the dwarves and elves and this kind of thing. It was a bit harder to stand out. Uh, the sci-fi art style, like setting, is a bit art intensive because you need to do the concepts first for everything. Or of course you can buy the assets, but then you end up with a mishmash of styles of tech and everything or it's very limited if you go with one asset pack basically um, so i was thinking about realism like there is lots of assets to buy they kind of should fit uh, but it's a bit too restrictive so i went with uh, why don't i add something like surreal supernatural to it and it actually led me to thinking about Roadside Picnic and the Stalker franchise. So, yeah, and that's how the Radius concept came to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and my part in that... Oh, no, not my part, still your okay, yeah, evolution. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Because um, through these five years, the concept changed very drastically. Like, it's not like I sat and dreamt of the game and then we were doing it for five years and, like, finally the game came out. No. It, it, it's just not, not working that way. Um, basically, the first game uh, was uh, like Escape from Tarkov, but single player. <laughs> so you're, there was no shop, no save game. You just drop into the zone and you run around, find your weapons there with what like random, like with what uh, you are lucky to get. And then you complete the mission or you fail and start over. But that was too hardcore, and the learning curve was notoriously big. So we were like slowly drifting to a more like complete game scenario when you have a shop, you have a proper progression, tutorial, save games in any place. Yeah, that kind of thing, but it took us like five years to... <laughs> yeah, that was a long time. And... Um, for me, the reason why picking up into the radius and focusing on it could be interesting. First, is that when you release the game on Steam and you have like maybe 50 reviews and they're mixed and you don't know what to do, like it was for Into the Radius. I kind of had this experience before and uh, I thought that my experience and knowledge of a failed game could apply to this game in a way, so my knowledge would be relevant. Like, okay, like we have these reviews, what are we going to do? What would be the cadence of updates? Does it even make sense to continue? Stuff like that. Also, as Alexei mentioned, uh, the roadside picnic and stalker series and all this atmosphere is in a way many things to many people because when you say these keywords to people they start thinking oh, okay it's a night and you have the guitar and there is a moon outside and there's mutants howling somewhere so again it's 
pretty sellable in a way because it invokes diverse fantasies. Another thing, again, the timing for the project was right in a way that the company context was ripe for a new project. And again, this autumn for the market. And of course, we were privileged and I say this is a privilege. We were privileged to continue because lots of games are being released and then abandoned if the situation is like if the people are in struggle. So yeah, that was my reasoning. Um, and as we talked previously before about this premium live game, we also wanted to test this project by applying this a bit modified model which could be named as like premium live games. And uh, yeah, Alexei, you start. Yeah, it actually like came naturally for the project because we already were in early access and we like did a small prototype and upload it and we patched it constantly. So also we needed to validate and promote the project because not only to the customers but to the studio internally so we needed to prove that there is interest in the project constantly so yeah it was a natural fit for us other than that is the market situation in vr basically when there is not a lot of content coming and if you stick in the top seller uh, like for example on steam all new people that come, they basically buy your game. And there are uh, constantly new people coming, not like hundred thousands, but like en enough. And uh, the other thing is uh, talking to customers because we started the Discord right off the bat. And the peop we were actually like the two of us devs were just talking to our customers and like replying to them and like talking to them what they want. And it was really uplifting for us because people loved the game. They were buying in on the fantasy and they were really supportive. Like I, bur I had to ban my first like player on the fourth year of the development. So basically, <laughs> yeah, we were blessed by the community. Uh, and it was really affecting how we developed things. At, at some point, we really had to like push the developers out of Discord because they were like taking things too personally for some time. They were like taking over times to fix something that like is just not sustainable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and from my point of view, again, I was interested in testing this a bit modified premium games business model. I was a bit frustrated at the time that when you're in a premium context, you make a game, you put a label on it, you put a price on it, you sell it. If it kind of sells, if it doesn't sell well, you abandon it and go to the next one. I think at the time it didn't do enough justice both to developers and people playing this game. So uh, in the industry there is this metaphor of the Stegosaurus tail, which means that uh, the curve of sales of your game on Steam resembles a spike tail of a dinosaur. So you have this like largest spike which is the release of your game and then all the spikes go smaller 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 until there's like a tail end and there's nothing happening please come in yes yes no worries you come to the juicy part sales curve yeah so and this is how it looks for premium games and uh, i thought that like what if we reverse it what, what if we like, what if we inject value up until it makes sense, if the game is a fit for that? And you could think that this is the curve for, the, for Into the Radius, but actually this is the sales curve for Into the Radius. This small peak is going out of early access, like exiting. This is the global release, and this is winter summer sale so this is how it should be for people if the game is a fit and this is how maybe you should do it and also at the time hades as uh, who played hades yes yes yeah super giant games are very nice guys so hades kind of paved the way they showed that you could do things with a premium aplomb but also live game it please come in no 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 
you're interested, come in. We convert everyone who come in. Everyone comes in, nobody gets out. This is the rule. So, and they actually showed that you could, again, uh, do things in high quality, but iterate on them. I think they had like a cycle of two years after leaving early access in a way, and they froze the game. Now they're just supporting it, but that was an example. And also the company context, CM Games context, was attuned to that as well, because basically what we were doing, we were making games as a services. And we kind of have a certain expertise and gravitation to that model in a way. Yeah, and also like funny things could happen when you live game your game. Yeah, Alex, say this is also the juiciest part. Yeah, and as you can see from the slide, we have this enemy called spawn. This is basically a spiderly blob that jumps around and it moves very fast and it, it's notoriously hated by the players because it's hard to hit. Uh, and it basically does a little damage, but yeah, it's, it's hard to kill. And there was a bug we introduced that those guys stopped uh, attacking you. They b were basically coming to the player and just jumping near his feet. So the player were starting to play with them, actually, because they have physical hands. They were like patting them and like trying to feed them some pineapples or beef cans. And they name it Pecho. And because of the Pechorsk, it's the area that the, play, uh, the story is happening. So uh, we basically d did a patch on Friday or something, like uh, came on Monday and see that there is a bug and like started fixing it. We fixed it and like the giant outcry, like and every like on Steam, on everything, like Reddit, everything blows up and like give us the patch back. Like why you kill patch? Like why? Developers, please stop. I'm like, who the <laughs> is Pecho? <laughs> like, we start reading on it, and yeah, turns out that they imagine it, and like, they were so fond of it that we decided to turn it into a community meme first, and then into a proper game feature. But that's still not in the game. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they wait for Pecho. They will be waiting forever. So b basically, every patch note, they're like, yeah, it, it's nice, yeah, no but where Pecho. is Pecho? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All that graphics overhaul are nice, but where is my friend? Yeah. Uh, so a bit of what's happening now. I think it's your turn again, Alex. Yeah. Yeah, you take all the stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's my game. Yes. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, as we are talking, we're running with this premium model. We don't do DLCs, no microtransactions, no nothing. And we do free updates every two, three months or so, at least we try. And we do a discount on every cooldown the Steam allows us. We participate in every fest, everything. So as you see, saw those spikes on the graph, They're, they are from sales. So we basically get most of our income on sales. And yeah, the 30% discount, we found out that it's basically best for us in terms of revenue. So yeah, we, we tested lower on, or higher, but like this juicy wish list notification from 30% and still not like dumping the price too much. It, it actually works for us. So we're reinvesting into team development, uh, size, quality, and everything. So we went from like three, four people to 15. That's quite a growth. And we're working on the port on Quest 2 and continue to evolve our live gaming approach to see what else can we do. Mm -hmm. And a bit more of that. Uh, I think s a week ago or so, the project celebrated two years in live operations. So what like other things which are happening now are basically prototyping, because we want to figure out are there any other juicy concepts and games ideas which could be brought to life. Like, would like some spatial puzzle work? Would some like realistic racing game work? Would some arcade demolition game work? Just like this anti-stress thing. Would some survival under the ground, underground survival game work in VR? Because basically VR is, well, you could try lots of things in there. And also, 
there is a certain publishing situation going on in VR right now. So there are certain publishers, but basically everyone is learning what to do. And so we as a company also try to figure out whether we need a partnership or we learn it by ourselves. And it also this like one of the questions from a series of long, hard questions to solve. Another thing is that next year, I guess potentially will be like this zoo of hardware in VR because some headsets are coming in and there's competition and there are dev kits flowing. So it's gonna be a bit of like this, uh, like where do you put your games or where do you go in a way? It's, yeah. And if you imagine Steam before Greenlight, this is how it goes for platform contacts and the quality of developer tools, all this kind of stuff. So if you start there and if you know someone who knows someone, it re it's really useful to go and talk to those people and establish the contact because in five years, they're going to be everywhere on top. Yeah. So uh, yeah, Alexei, what's next for you? Yeah, nice joke. Yeah, yeah. Not going to happen. No, no. Okay, yeah. So, as we're like, and the slide previous was the cake we gave to our players to celebrate the anniversary. It's a, actually a photogrammetry cake. And uh, we are currently expanding to the new platforms. We're thinking like PSVR 2 or those uh, Chinese headsets or whatever. Uh, they come up with. Also, we're bridging the gaps in team expertise and we will try to use what we have learned about our product, our team, our tech in the sequel. Mm -hmm. And um, if a thing hits, it hits. So eight out of ten games fail in game dev, yeah? So if you hit something good, you need to think about it as a series if it's possible and not hard in the original concept. So we're thinking about that. Another thing is this cultural development in a way that virtual reality requires a bit different set of skills and development approaches. For example, if you go through the standard like document and then development and then back to design and then iteration kind of cycle, it's really long because virtual reality is like, it's a lot about this like tuning and tweaking and being inside there. So a certain autonomy of developers, designers, artists is needed. It like decreases the distance between the idea and the implementation.